Hallelujah. Before you're seated this morning, would you pray with me? Father God, we stand humbly before you today. We ask you, oh God, that you would minister grace in this place today, that you would speak to our hearts and to our minds and to our souls. Lord, that you would touch us in a way that we have not been ministered to before. God, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us, that you would multiply into us your living word. God, that we would be able to grasp your word and understand your word and allow your word to shape our destiny in our lives today. We bind anything that would try to hinder the reading of your word or the preaching of your word. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would hover in this room today and speak peace to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could ever get a hold of just how important you are to God, you would change how you view yourself. You wouldn't be so hard on yourself. We sang a song a few minutes ago, and one of the lines says, Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Nobody. And God tells us that in his word, in this verse. If God be for us, you finish it. If God be for us, so nobody can stop him. The only one that can stop him is our free will. In the fact sometimes that we will not adhere to his written word. This morning I want to use as a thought, when the church finds her voice again, as a title for the sermon. And hopefully I can get through this pretty quick. I know we've got other things to do today. But it's a, you know, a, a sermon is like a pot of coffee. It has to percolate, so we'll see. Since the creation of the earth, especially after the fall, there has been a power struggle going on for control. Great spiritual battles are being fought and are being fought in the unseen world. Right now, there are battles being fought in the unseen world. Some of us don't even believe that, but it's throughout Scripture. We see this played out in every facet of our life, in our families, our church, our government, work, school. Everything that we touch has been touched by the adversary. Satan has and is struggling to control for control of the earth. He has infiltrated every part of our society from the church house to the White House. He has set up a doctrine that captures the attention of man. He has made promises that he cannot keep, but that society has bought into. I want to read something to you that was, and you can find what I'm going to read today. You can find it online, or you can buy a book called The Naked Communist um, by Cleon Sausen. And in 1963, there were 45 points read into our Congress. They're on record in our congressional record. You can go there and find this. It was a 45 communist goals that they had for the United States of America. Now, I'm not going to read all 45 of them to you today, but I just want to read a few of them because they're pertinent for what's happening on our society today. Number 15, capture one or both of the political parties in the United States. Number 17, get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and current, and current communistic propaganda. Soften the curriculum. Get control of the teachers' association. Put the party line in the textbooks. Number 19, use student riots to foment public protest against programs or organizations. Number 20, infiltrate the press. Get control of what's being put out. Eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and violation of free speech. Are we seeing this played out today? 
Break down the cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography, obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, movies, radio, and television. Present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. This was put in, read into our Congre con Congress in 1963. Boy, are we living in it. It's just taken them over 50 years to get it there, but they're getting it here. Infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Remember last week when I showed you the picture of a church that's singing uh, songs about climate change instead of about Jesus Christ. Eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the grounds that it violates the principle of, and who knows the principle? Separation of church and state. Discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, out of step with modern needs. Discredit the American Founding Fathers. Well, they're pulling every one of them down across America today. Belittle forms of American culture by discouraging the teaching of American history in public schools. Support any socialist movement to give centralized control over any part of the culture, education, social agencies, welfare programs, and mental health clinics. Number 40, discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. Number 41, emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. In school, you cannot give them an aspirin, but you can give them an abortion without the parents' consent. I believe, church, that we are seeing played out on the scene the manifesto of the communists that they put into our Congress in 1963. We didn't know that. We didn't call it that. And how many of you in here have read these before and know it? Raise your hand if you knew this. There's three, four people in here that knew that was read into Congress. I would venture to say that if you would ask somebody on the street, they have no idea about what's going on. Today I want to use as a subject when the church finds her voice again. And I want to use three points to get there. <clears throat> Number one, God gave us a voice. Number two, the church lost her voice. And number three, but when the church finds her voice again. God gave the church a voice. He gave us a voice to affect the physical and spiritual happenings on planet earth. God did that when he created us. He gave us a voice. Matthew 21, 18 through 21. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to the mountain, Be moved and cast into the sea, it will be done. All that we're seeing played out in society today, we have been giving a, a voice to address it. If, we, if Jesus could stop a fig tree, and if he said you can stop a fig tree or move a mountain, I believe it's time for the church to begin to do something. God gave us a voice to affect the spirituality of planet earth and the physical and mental things that are happening. He gave us a voice, but we're not using the voice. Matthew 10:1. We're going to have to go quick. And when he had called his disciples to him, he gave them power. He said, all of you come here. I've got a gift for you. I'm going to give you something that will aid you for the rest of your life. And it will aid planet earth as long as earth exists. And he called the disciples. Are you a disciple this morning? He gave them power over what? Every unclean spirit. We need to go to the White House. We need to go to the government. And we need to clean out the demonic forces that are there. And pull down the strongholds that are being set up in our communities. We have the power to stop the evil that's happening. 
we don't know that we got it, but God gave it to us. You know there's a devil loose on the earth, right? You know that you have no ability to de defeat him on your own. But God said, don't worry. I will give you power over him. To cast him out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. The next scripture in Matthew, Tony. He said, I will give you all of this stuff. I will give you the power to address disease. I will give you the power to address sickness. I will give you the ability to tell it where to go. He said, as you go, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. These two verses were given, a, were given a voice to address sickness, demons, to tell them where to go. Do you think for a moment that Christ meant for sickness and demonic activity to be in the body of Christ? Do you think for one minute he desired that? Or desires that today? He don't. Do you think that he intended for our government to be controlled by an adversary? And control everything that we believe? Certainly these things have been and are happening in the church. But it's not the will of God. We have bought the lie that everything is supposed to happen in heaven. It is not supposed to happen everything in heaven. Read Matthew 6. The Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth. Do you think this stuff that we're seeing is going on in heaven? I don't think any of this is happening in heaven right now. In fact, I got a report and I read it. It's called the Bible. And the Bible said when the devil tried to take over, what happened to the devil? The Bible said he was escorted to the, the, the porch of heaven and kicked out. And Jesus said, I saw him like lightning falling from to the earth. We have bought the lie that everything is supposed to be like this. The world is supposed to go to hell in a handbasket and us with it. And we're supposed to barely hang on. And then one day the rapture will take place and we will leave. Yes, the rapture is coming. Yes, things are going to get rough. But yes, we can stand it down until he comes. We can stand it down. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus told his disciples how he was going to do this. In this verse of scripture, this is what it says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive an ability. You will receive something that is supernatural when he comes on you. In other words, the disciples were here and they did not have that kind of power. But he said, I'm going to send another comforter from heaven. And when he comes, you will have power to deal with the adversary that's loose on the earth. I'm going to give you the ability to deal with it. Don't hide in the bunker. Don't run from your responsibility. I'm going to give you the power to stand in his face and deal with him. You want to know real power. We look at the demonic and think it has real power by some of the movies you see. That's Hollywood. That's not reality. Buddy, when you get in a room with someone that's demon possessed and you cast a demon out of them and you watch it leave, that is not Hollywood. That's reality. And that's the power that's in the Holy Spirit. And that is the voice that God gave to the church. He gave the church the ability and the voice to address the devil and tell him where to stand down. He said, I give you the ability to tell him to stand down in your family, in your home, in your city, in your government, and in your church. But we can't do that because we lost our voice. The church lost her voice. We lost our voice when we went to sleep. Matthew 26, 36 through 45. A beautiful verse of scripture. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. He knows that time is short. He calls together the church. He said, you guys come out here with me. He takes three guys with him. Three, three leaders in the church. He said, you come with me. You stay right here and pray. I'm going to go over there and pray. What did the Bible say when Jesus went back to heaven? He is in heaven doing what? Making intercession for us. That was a picture of what he was getting ready to do for the church. Then Jesus came with them the place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter 
and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. The word watch means pray. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found the church sleeping. And he said, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into the tempt into temptation. Folks, the church is tempted beyond imagination right now today. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know why our flesh is weak? We put everything before Almighty God. We might as well face the facts, church. I, I, we put everything before God. It is the last thing we want to do. We're going to do it because we're faithful and it's part of our routine. But it is not the first thing on our mind when we get up in the morning. It is not the first thing. Again, a second time he went away and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found the church asleep again. And their eyes were heavy. They should have went to bed earlier last night. So he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Are you still sleeping? And I like the other word, and resting. Well, you know we got to have our break. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And, buddy, the body of Christ is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. I just read to you the manifesto of the communists. They want to infiltrate the church to the point that we no longer preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we, re we replace it with other things. We replaced the Bible with a social justice. In fact, one, one quarter of all the pastors in the United States of America believe that it is more important to meet your physical need than your spiritual need. Something is wrong with that. It's anti-Christ, anti-Bible. The Bible said, Jesus, when he left, he said, I'm going there to make intercession for you. I want you to stay here and keep praying. The problem is he is making intercession there and we are sleeping here. We lost our voice when we let them push us out of the halls of justice and government. A government that we pay for, as a matter of fact. When they told us, you can come to our meetings and pray, but you cannot pray in the name of Jesus. You can pray in the name of Allah and Buddha, but not in the name of that's above every name. Do not invoke the name of Jesus. Why do you suppose they don't want you to pray in that name? Because the devil has read the book and Jesus told his disciples, anything you ask in my name will get done. I don't want you praying in that name because you may invoke some things in this city council that I don't want. You may stop some things that are not right and I don't want that. So don't use the name that is above every name. You can use a generic name. You can use Buddha. You can use Allah. You can use Krishna. But don't dare invoke the name that is above every name by power and position and authority. Don't use that name. That name may get us in trouble. We won't get it passed. We won't be able to get that legislation through if we let these crazy Christians in here and they pray in Jesus' name. You go to a city meeting and see, they'll let you pray, but they don't want, they'll tell you up front, don't invoke that name. That name is offensive. <laughs> it is. It offends the devil. 
Every time you call on his name, he becomes offended. Let me tell you, the church better get back to calling on the name that is above every name. His name is Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Perhaps the devil read the book in Luke 10, 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even... The demons are subject to us in your name. Uh, not in Buddha's name. Not in Allah's name. But in the name of Jesus. Every demon in hell backs up when you walk in a city council and use that name. When you use that name, you are invoking a name above all names. Maybe he read Mark 16, 17 through 18. And these signs shall follow them in my name. The devil's afraid you'll get in a meeting, a government meeting somewhere, and there'll be one of them full of a demon, and you might discern it and cast him out. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And the devil don't like that. He's done everything in the world to get rid of the Holy Ghost. Guess what? It ain't happening. They will take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing. Come on. Look at what kind of juice you got. Some of you have never experienced that. You've lived in comfortable America all of your life. Let me tell you, I've been in places where you drank water that you shouldn't ought to drink. When I was in the Marine Corps, a young man that I won to the Lord, we were, they were out in the desert place. There was no water. There was nothing. There were bomb craters where they'd been bombing. And they were told, do not drink this water. It will kill you. My friend had his platoon out there. They were starving to death for water. He found a bomb crater. He said, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I'm not going to die of thirst. I'm going to put my finger in this water. I'm going to invoke Mark 17, or 16, 17, and 18. I'm going to drink this water, and nothing's going to happen to me. The whole platoon drank the water that was poisoned, and it did not hurt them. Why? Because a man of God was in the house, and he evoked the name Jesus Christ and said, Water be pure, and he drank it. The devil might be afraid that you've got a hold of John 14. And whatever you ask in my name, somebody help me out here. The Bible said when you walk in a meeting and you ask it in my name, that will I do. You know why we don't see that? Because we don't believe that. That's for some of them super spiritual people. You know, I've read the book cover to cover, and I've never found super spiritual people. I've never ran across that verse. I've looked for it. Because obviously a lot of the church think it's in there. Obviously we do. I've looked for the super saint. They're not there. Somebody said, Paul's a super saint. Have you read about his life? I mean, the devil had to give him a thorn to keep him humble. I don't think he was a super saint. I think he was a man full of the Holy Ghost and did what the Bible said and he believed what Jesus Christ taught. That's what I I think that's all it was. Well, Peter was a super saint. (laughs) You ain't read the book. The man cut a guy's ear off. But he also walked down the street and they drug people out and laid on the streets and his shadow healed them. Peter was always running his mouth, putting his foot in his mouth. Well, read the book. That's what he said. (laughs) He was rebuked more than any other disciple. And whatever you ask in my name, don't you know the devil has read that verse of Scripture? And he said, I have got to stop the church from being able to evoke the name of Jesus because if they pray in his name, his Father will do it. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 16, 23. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, you cannot go to God and pray and skip in the name of. 
Go ahead and kid yourself if you want to. I didn't write the book, but I am reading it. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing. We ask God to help our grass grow when it's dry. What? The God of heaven, I, I, I'm thankful when mine dies. That means I don't have to mow it anymore. Hallelujah, not until September. October, yes. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask! And you will receive that your joy may be full. Not my joy, yours. I think maybe the devil has read those verses of scriptures and he said, let's keep that name from being invoked. If you do go to the halls of justice and pray, do not ask God to help them get a new park, a new pool, or a new rec center. Ask God to give them the leadership ability of Moses, the courage of David, the wisdom of Solomon, the tenacity of Paul, and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you pray in that name, hearts will change, lives will change, our society will change, men will change. We need a change, church. We lose, lost our voice. We lose our voice when we let unforgiveness rule our hearts. Mark eleven twenty three 23 through 26. Lord, I don't know how to say this sweetly, so there ain't no sugar I can put on. I'm just going to say it like a southern boy. Some of y'all stay mad at everything. I don't get it. You're always upset. Somebody goes, <coughs> you're upset. I, I don't get that. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, I'm going back up, I'm going back and, and, and tying back into the verse about the fig tree. He just told him that, right? He said, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be moved and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says is done, he will have his answer. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And, and whenever you stand praying... If you have anything against, oh, you mean you can't select? I thought, you know, all this time I thought I could select two. You know, I thought I could have two or three over in the corner that I, I, was, I was upset with. As long as I kept the 97, I could have 3%. I could, I could have 3% that I'm all bent out of shape over over some reason. It don't make any sense. No, it says, if you have anything against anyone. The Bible even tells us to pray for our enemies. If we would simply start doing what the Bible teaches, the forgiving, the praying for our enemies, and doing all those little things that we just shove under there, you know. We, we say, I ain't going to drink, I ain't going to smoke, I ain't going to gamble, I ain't going to run around, I ain't going to chase, I ain't going to do that, I ain't going to do this, I'm not going to look at pornography, but I'm going to be upset and mad and unforgiving towards somebody. And then I'm going to go stand in the parlor and ask God to help me, and he's going to say no. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not, if you do not, sorry about that, you ain't going. Your Father will not forgive you, nor will he hear your cries when you call him. We lost our voice in 1962 when the Supreme Court banned school-sponsored prayer and we were asleep. We lost our voice in 1970 when uh, early-term abortion became law and, and we were asleep. And we're asleep again now that we got late-term abortion. In November 2012, we were asleep when same-sex marriage became a law of the land. God gave us a voice and we gave it back. We lost it because we fell asleep in the church. We got so comfortable 
And the manifesto of the communist was so, of the devil, was so insidious and so slow working. It's been over 50 some years since they read that into our Congress. That was what they intended to do. And that's what they began to do in 1963. They began to flood the schools, flood the government, flood every facet of life. News media, schools, churches, everywhere. The enemy began to infiltrate. And the church was asleep and didn't go, I discerned that that's not from the Holy Spirit. In fact, many churches began to teach the Holy Spirit was only for the apostles and the disciples. And a vast number of the body of Christ completely quit speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Even some of this room says, do you think it's necessary? Did, does the Bible say it's necessary? Then it's necessary. Don't ask me my opinion about what something God has already said. My opinion doesn't amount to a hill of beans. What the book says is what matters. What I say doesn't matter. Do you think the Holy... If I say I don't think the Holy Spirit's real, or I don't think this, or I don't think that, it has no credibility. It doesn't change the fact that it is. That He is. That He is reality, and that we must call upon Him. I'm going to finish the last section. But when we, the church finds her voice again... Come on now. I think the adversary has awakened a giant that's been asleep a long while. But I think we're about to get up. I think we're starting to wipe the slumber out of our eyes and to rise from our sleep. And when the church begins to take her place on planet Earth, things will begin to get better in this nation and around the world. Folks, the world is in tears today. This is not an American thing. This is a world thing. All over the world, the adversary is doing the same thing in every government. Go to China, in communist China. Name the name of Jesus. They're tearing down churches and burning all their books right now in the 21st century. And the church is asleep. In Africa, they're taking little young little girls and little boys and making sex slaves out of them. And the churches, it doesn't affect me. You know, I'm still going to have my latte in the morning down at Starbucks. I'm not gonna buy. Yes, it is bothering us. It is in our land. It is in our government. It is in our school. It is in our churches. It is in there. It's on our jobs. Go to your job. If you don't think it's true, go to your job somewhere in the morning and say something that's not PC. And watch who calls you to the office. HR will have you in their office in a heartbeat. One of our guys was walking through the parking lot and didn't speak to another guy. And he went in and said he's creating a hostile work environment. The guy just didn't, didn't hear him. HR had him in his office in about five minutes. You don't think it infiltrates every portion of life? It infiltrates every portion of life. But I got good news. The church is beginning to wipe the slumber from our eyes. And when we do that and give God a shout of praise to our king, when we shake off the dust of mediocrity, I believe the Holy Spirit will rise in us again. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10 will be a reality. If we've ever needed reality to come, we need this verse. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Some of us in America have decided we're not at war. Well, if I've read, we are. Some of the things are coming out with is crazy. I, I just can't go into all of it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we went to some places of government and we pulled down the stronghold? Just got a hold of our government. I have never seen such craziness in my life. In every phase of government, from the city council... To the presidency. I've never seen this much in my life. We need to pull down some strongholds. Cast down some arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We're supposed to do that. We have taken everything that we read in the Bible. And made it only for my house. 
This stuff is to govern the world. Do you know who God's governing body is on the, on the planet? The church. We ain't doing a good job. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We need to see the strongholds begin to tumble down to the ground around the world. We need to see it in our cities that are held by demonic powers where corruption and riots and murder and mayhem are the news of the day where the devil is allowed to prowl around like a lion. These places, these strongholds need to come down to the ground. And when we begin to invoke the name of Jesus Christ, when we stop being so busy that we don't have time to go to the church house and get on our knees for 30 or 40 minutes or an hour and call down the power of the living God when we don't have the opportunity or the time to go pray at the halls of justice. But somehow think things are going to get better because we live in America. It's always been that way, y'all. I hear people say, oh, we'll recover. We'll recover. We're not going to recover. We're not going to keep recovering. These manifestos are infiltrating everything. In fact, it was said that America is like a healthy body, and its resistance is threefold. It's patriotism, it's morality, and it's spiritual life. Every one of those places have been attacked. It also said in that manifesto, a communist said this, if we can get those three areas, America will collapse from within. Let me finish. We struggle with this because it's always been the norm for so long. But it's time for the church to find her voice and to start tearing down the stronghold in our churches, in our neighborhoods, in our city, in our state, in our nation. Why do we need to settle for a governor or a president or anybody else who lets lawlessness be the order of the day? It's time for the church to speak up. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, he used his voice. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, was void, without form, and darkness was everywhere. If we use our voice, we can create what he created. Oh, I don't believe that. Well, you hadn't read the book. Let us make man in our image, and let us give him dominion. Over everything that creeps on the earth. You know the devil's a creep and he's on the earth. We have dominion over him. And listen to me. And the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there, and there was. Let there be light, and there was light. He gave us the same ability. Matthew 21, 20. Story of the fig tree. And when they... And when the di disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? Jesus told him, You can do the same thing. Fig tree today, no fig tree tomorrow. It don't take 100 years. We are under the assumption that we can pray, but it will take a lifetime or years for anything to happen. I don't believe that. The Bible does not say that, but somehow we believe that. There was a fig tree today, and there was no fig tree tomorrow. There can be chaos today and no chaos tomorrow. There can be riots tonight, but none tomorrow night. There can be trouble on every hand, but no trouble on the other hand. But if we assume that it's going to take a lifetime, then that's how long we're going to be there. I don't know about you, but I'm not for living there. We need to find our voice. We need to find and utter prophetic words. Let's look at Jeremiah 6. Give these two verses one, two. One right after the other. Therefore, hear. This is Jeremiah. He came out and he said, Therefore, hear, you nations. And know, O congregation, what is among them. 
Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people. The fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words nor my law, but rejected it. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah came out and prophesied that. That doesn't mean you can go out on your front porch and yell and the whole world hear you. That's not what it's talking about. That's a prophetic word that he is giving to the nation. He is speaking prophetically and giving it to the nation and telling them they'll be rejected if they don't hear the word. We need to start uttering some, some prophecies and begin to declare some things and begin to stop some things. We have to understand that it's not an issue of what our words would normally do. It, ra it, it is rather speaking for God which releases His power to accomplish things around the world. Let me give you an example of that. How many of you have ever heard of a man by the name of Dick Eastman? Wow. Anyway, Dick Eastman was a, a great author and preacher. He's passed away now and wrote a lot of books. In 1989... God told him, I want you to go to Germany. I want you to go to the Berlin Wall, and I want you to lay your hands on it and say five words. Come down in Jesus' name. Does anybody know that the Berlin Wall is down? Now, the Berlin Wall didn't come down until November 6, 1991, over two years later. How would you like to get up one morning and say, Honey, God spoke to me and told me to go to Germany. And lay hands on the wall and say, In the name of Jesus, come down. And then get back on an airplane and fly back home. Your wife would probably say, Well, you're crazy and you're not going. And I don't know what you're thinking about. He got on an airplane. He flew to Germany. He got in a, a car. He drove out to the wall. He put his hand on the wall and said, In the name of Jesus, come down. Put his hand back down. Got back in his car. Went back to the airport. Got on the airplane. Come back home. Prophetically, he tore that wall down. We don't know that. Two years. But he spoke prophetically to that wall in the name of Jesus come down. You know what the Berlin Wall was, right? It's the wall that separated East and West Germany. Communists on the East, free on the West. The wall came down. What, an, what a man of God, huh? <laughs> With our voice, we can, affect, we can affect things now and in the future. I don't know about you, but I still have some mountains that need to be moved, some strongholds that need to be pulled down. I still have some bodies that need to be healed and giants that need to be slain. I don't know about you, but I do. In the garden of prayer, Jesus told his disciples to stay here and watch and to pray. And they went to sleep. We are a generation that enjoys church, but we don't enjoy praying. We enjoy preaching, but we do not enjoy praying. We enjoy worship, but we do not enjoy praying. Jesus did not tell his disciples that night, I want you to stay here and worship. I want you to stay here and preach. I want you to stay here and have a church service. He said, I want you to stay here and pray while I go there and pray. Somebody ought to tell me, amen. He told them to watch and pray. The devil heard that statement and knew the power in it. He knew it. He, he knows that prayer drives out compromise. Prayer drives out carnality. Prayer drives out confusion. Prayer drives, awakens our heart to God's direction. So he caused their eyes to be heavy and their flesh to be weak. And for them to go to sleep. I can't imagine Christ coming to the church three times and every time he comes he finds us sleeping. Church, the world is in tears this morning. The coronavirus has taken loved ones. The economy is struggling. There's unrest around the world in almost every country. If there ever was a time we need, to, we need hope and grace and unity and salvation, it's now. If there's ever been a time we needed to find our voice, we need to find our voice. But church, we're going to find our voice where we left our voice. You didn't hear me or you'd have shouted. We're going to find our voice where we left our voice. We left it in the garden while we were sleeping. 
We're going to find it in the prayer closet, not somewhere else. You can only find your voice where God gave you the voice. That's where we laid it down, was when we fell asleep. And we've been sleeping through a lot of history that's happened to our nation. We've slowly and methodically allowed the adversary to, to crawl upon us. Look, a lot of this stuff is not going to affect me. I got about 25, 30 more years, if I'm lucky, on this earth. Some of you got 50 and 60 years. You got to ask yourself this question. How do I want to be living then? I'm not preaching about me. I don't believe. I'm 65. So if I live 30 more years, I'm going to be an old guy. I'm still that young. Hope I'm still pastoring. I don't know. But I see these young folks sitting in here. That's who I'm concerned about today. Oh, it ain't going to happen. Well, go ahead and feel that way. That's what we said in 1963. In 1963, I certainly didn't think I'd be seeing what I'm seeing today. Certainly didn't think the, the media would be controlled. One of the political parties would be controlled. I certainly didn't think all of those things that we're seeing would be happening. But because the church stopped using the gift of discernment and started preaching, blab it and grab it. We put more emphasis on the outer stuff. We put more emphasis on preaching. We put more emphasis on worship. We put, nothing wrong with that. You've got to have that. That's a part of it. But it can't, it can't be the greater part. It cannot be the greater part. Praying still has to be a part of what we do. Would you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> I hope that I have preached a sermon that will at least stir our hearts a little bit. These things have been heavy on my heart. And I've asked the Lord to not let me be cloud, a cloud without rain. How many knows that's in the Bible? How many has read that? Okay, I don't want to be a cloud without rain. Translation. I don't want to be a church that's all fluff. We sing good. We preach good. We, sh we shout and we get elegant a little bit. And then we go home until next week. That's not what God's called us to be. We skip all the other meetings because we're tired. Well, we may get a lot tireder. This Wednesday night, we will have prayer again at this local church. I was so excited on the first Wednesday night when we had 40. Last Wednesday night, we had 12. I'm not picking on you. I'm not shaming you. I'm not trying to put you in the corner. I'm just trying to help you have some reality in life. There's just some things that's more important than anything we got going on in our life. It's just more important. You may think it ain't, and that's fine. And you may want to argue with me after church, and that's fine. I stand behind what I preach. We're just going to have to find some time to put some priorities in place. Give me some music if you want to. Let's go to the Lord this morning. The altar's open if you'd like to come and pray in the altar. I want to find my voice. I do not want to be a cloud without rain. 